energy and how we get more energy and how we can uh, basically make our muscles more efficient. So let's see, I gotta get this pinned on. Take it that way. Pin. Come on. Okay. All right. So what we're talking about is ATP. Whenever we use the word energy, we're talking about ATP. And that's the only source of energy that we directly use for contraction. Remember, ATP is what's got to uh, connect to that myosin head, cock it, and get it ready to go. That's the direct source of energy for contraction. Um, our muscles only store up about four to six seconds of ATP. But if you think about it, most movements don't really last more than, you know, just a couple of seconds, okay? And then your body quickly restores or uh, regenerates that energy. But we have about four to six seconds of energy available to us. And then we have to uh, find an alternate source of energy. We have three ways of generating ATP. The first one is a really quick way. It's a, and I've got a picture, and I'm going to go through these step by step. Just uh, uh, hang on with me. We have direct phosphorylation of ADP by creatinine phosphate. And remember, ADP is adenosine diphosphate. ATP is adenosine triphosphate. So let's see this little P here? Basically, you take the P off of creatinine phosphate, add it to ADP, and you get ATP. And I'll show you a graph of that. Um, this is without oxygen. doesn't require oxygen. There's another anaerobic, no oxygen required, called glycolysis also a pathway to generate um, ATP. And then we have aerobic respiration, and this does require oxygen. So when we talk about doing aerobic exercises, this is a way to exercise and increase our uh, oxygen use, our efficiency of using oxygen to create ATP. So how does that creatinine phosphate work? Basically, we store creatinine phosphate in our muscle cells. Remember, our muscle cells have myoglobin, which has oxygen. They have glycosomes, which uh, contain uh, sugar, uh, glycogen. Uh, we have many mitochondria, many nuclei. They also have a lot of creatinine phosphate. And it's a quick way to produce ATP. We have ADP inside of our cells, and you can quickly form ADP, ATP by basically taking the phosphate off the uh, creatinine phosphate, adding it to the ADP, and making ATP. This creatinine kinase, you probably already know what that is. What's the ACE mean? It's an enzyme. It's an enzyme. So it's a catalyst. So it causes this reaction to occur very, very quickly. So it's an enzyme that causes the reaction of uh, creatinine phosphate plus ADP to become creatinine and ATP really quickly, and it's a very fast way to get energy. But it's not real efficient. You only get one ATP per one creatinine phosphate. So as soon as you've depleted your creatinine phosphate, you can't do it anymore, okay? So we only have a limited amount of creatinine phosphate in our cells, and it's not real efficient. Um, if you'll think back, and I'm gonna cover this again, but just for comparison, you think back to cellular respiration, and we talked about uh, turning glucose into ATP. Do you guys remember how many ATPs you get for one glucose? Yeah, 34 to 38, we usually say 36, so 36, uh, ATPs per one glucose. That's really efficient. So a one-to-one -one ratio is not real efficient, but it's quick. Now we have an anaerobic pathway, uh, and basically when this occurs is when you're at 70% of your muscular uh, contractile activity. Okay, so think about when your muscles are bulging and they're contracting. All right, they're compressing the blood vessels. If you compress the blood vessels, you're cutting off oxygen supply. Okay, so there's no more oxygen coming. It's impaired. And so you've got to have another way. If you can't aerobically make uh, ATP, you've got to have a way to make it anaerobically. And the way we do that is we convert pyruvic acid to lactic acid. So I've got a graph of that. Again, if you're kind of um, unsure about what's going on, go back and look at Ms. Graham's um, video from Unit 1 when she talks about cellular respiration. This is where this is coming from. Um, as part of the anaerobic pathway, you get the formation of lactic acid. And lactic acid is that stuff that burns. You know when you work out really, really uh, hard and the next day your muscles are really sore, or even immediately after they're burning? That's lactic acid build up in your muscles, and that's that burning sensation. Uh, but we can use lactic acid as fuel. 
When that, uh, when our muscles form lactic acid as a byproduct, it'll go into the bloodstream, and our livers and kidneys and heart can actually use lactic acid as fuel. All right, and then eventually you will basically convert lactic acid back to pyruvic acid. Pyruvic acid can then continue on through cellular respiration to make more ATPs. But a quick anaerobic way to get ATP as a, a byproduct is lactic acids. Let me go to that slide. Okay. So this is your anaerobic pathway. Um, you take your glucose from the blood, okay? The uh, glucose is then broken down, glycolysis. Lysis means to break or to cut. You break down the glucose, all right? And when you break down glucose into pyruvic acid, that gives you two ATPs. It doesn't require oxygen, but it's not very efficient. It's one glucose, two ATPs. A byproduct of that pyruvic acid, again, with no oxygen present, is lactic acid, and that's where you get the burning sensation. This is actually pretty quick. This is also a quick way to make ATP. Not efficient, but quick. You only get two ATPs for uh, glucose, and you get lactic acid, which is why if you do, um, for example, if, say, you, you, uh, you haven't exercised in a while, you're not conditioned, and so you decide to go out and play a softball game one day, and so you hit the ball, you run from home plate to first base as fast as you can, and when you get to first base, you're like, oh, man, my legs are burning. <laughs> That's because you haven't become efficient yet. You're not, you haven't turned it over into aerobic respiration. You're anaerobically using those muscles, and you're automatically forming that lactic acid, which is giving you that burn. Now, athletes condition themselves. They basically kind of bypass this anaerobic pathway. They go right into aerobic respiration pretty quickly, and they don't get that lactic acid burn uh, buildup. And I'm going to show you. Yeah, uh, yeah, strain muscle or lactic acid buildup because when you're thinking about your breathing, you're using those intercostals, using those abdominal muscles to help you breathe. You're just building up lactic acid there too, hitching your side. All right, so what we want to do for sustained activity, for endurance activity, we want to turn into, we want to go to aerobic uh, generation of ATP. So the aerobic pathway, using oxygen to turn glucose into ATP. That's what we're trying to do. 95% um, of our ATP is formed this way. So even at rest and just doing light exercise, we're aerobic. That's where we're aerobic creatures, otherwise we wouldn't need oxygen. So most of our ATP is formed this way. But we can also form it over the long haul when we're doing um, endurance exercises. The way you do this is you basically take glycogen, all right? It's stored inside the cell. Myoglobin stores oxygen. So you put the glycogen, the oxygen together, and you form ATP inside the mitochondria. And I've got a picture of that, so hang on. So what's the mitochondria? Powerhouse. The powerhouse. Making the energy. All right, so what we do, we've, we've, uh, this, we've taken the glucose, we've broken it down to pyruvic acid, and instead of doing that little side part where we took it to lactic acid, this time, we're going, to, we're going to efficiently convert pyruvic acid in the presence of oxygen into ATP. So we take the pyruvic acid, it goes into the mitochondria in the presence of oxygen, and through several steps called the Krebs cycle, which we're not going to go over, you get the formation of 32 ATPs. Now you're saying, well, I thought you said 36. Well, you also got some up here. Remember, there was some ATP formed when glucose became ATP pyruvic acid. So your net gain is 32 ATPs per glucose. All right? And this can occur for hours. You can form ATP this way for hours and hours and hours and hours. As long as you've got oxygen, as long as you've got sugar, you can do this. So let's kind of go uh, through and think about a person exercising. So if you're going to run, all right, let's just say this is a short, this is a sprint. Anything in blue is anaerobic. Anaerobic. Is that right? This is aerobic. So all the blue is anaerobic. The tan is aerobic. So when you first get up and go, the first six seconds, you're using that 
ATP that you've got stored in your muscles. You've got some stored up, about four to six seconds worth, okay? Then when that's used up, because your ATP has been converted to what? ADP. So now you have a lot of ADP there, right? You stored up creatinine phosphate. So now the creatinine phosphate plus ADP does its little thing and gives you ATP. But then you use that up quickly. It takes about 10 seconds. All right, so now what are you going to do? Now you've got to go into anaerobic, where you're going to basically take the glycogen, the glucose, turn it into pyruvate, and then lactic acid. And that can last about a minute. 30 to 40 seconds up to a minute, and then you're spent. There's no more ATP. The only way you can get ATP now is to turn into aerobic respiration. So if you do a, a lot of sprinters, they're very efficient. They tend to store up a lot of creatinine phosphate, and they can actually have, a, they can sprint really quickly using this equation. Because think about um, those guys that run the 100 meters really, really fast, those fastest men in the world. Yeah, they're running that in what? How? Yeah, like under, it's under 10 seconds, okay? So look here. They're done. <laughs> They've got enough ATP stored up because they got big muscles. A lot of time, have you ever noticed a lot of those guys, they're, they're a little bit bulky too. They, they, they're, they're lean, but they kind of got big thighs and stuff. A lot of myoglobin, big muscles, a lot of myoglobin storing up uh, ATP. They've, they've generated a lot of ATP. They've got a lot of mitochondria. So by the time that they've finished their 100 meters, they don't even need to move on in to any other kind of uh, ATP formation. They've got enough stored up in their muscles to do that. Now, for you and me, we've got to move into aerobic respiration. And that means we're using oxygen in order to form ATP. All right. Now, what happens when you fatigue a muscle? When you've worked a muscle so hard, it just won't contract anymore. It's physiological, physiologically impossible to contract. You've, done, you've basically spent the muscle. What's happened? Um, it can be one of basically three things. Maybe you're in an imbalance of uh, potassium or calcium or phosphate, okay? If you don't have the correct balance of these, let's think about potassium. Why would, why would having a potassium imbalance affect contraction? What do you need potassium to help you? What part of Electron of uh, excitation contraction coupling does potassium play a role in? Yeah, the repolarization. So when you do the actual potential, you've got to have that movement of potassium, right? So if you don't have potassium available, we usually have plenty of sodium. Very, very few people are low on sodium. That's not usually a problem. But people do tend to uh, run low on potassium. They'll say to eat a banana. The other thing you hear about is what? Eat mustard? Mustard. <laughs> so, so a lot of times that has to do with replacing those uh, potassium levels. All right, um, what happens if you don't have enough calcium? If you have low blood calcium, there's low calcium inside your cells if you're, if you're in balance. You don't have that calcium to cause the release of the acetylcholine. You don't have the calcium to be released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, so it can't bind to troponin. Okay, so that can be an imbalance. If you don't have enough peas, phosphates, the peas part of what? ATP, so you can't make that, you can't make the ATP, all right? So sometimes it's just basically a problem with the amount of ions you've got. Um, it could be prolonged exercise can actually damage the sarcoplasmic reticulum, okay? That, that web-like material over the, the muscle cell is actually damaged, and calcium can't be pumped in and out, out of the um, sarcoplasmic reticulum efficiently anymore. So calcium just kind of stays out in the cytosol. As long as calcium's in the cytosol, what's happening? It's bound to troponin. That muscle's contracting. You're getting that, that stained tetanus. You're getting that shaking feeling, okay, because the muscle's fatiguing. So these are all temporary? These are all temporary. You can fix this once you stop and repay that oxygen debt. You've got to get the oxygen back in the system. Or it's accumulation of lactic acid. And you guys know what that is, but once your muscles start burning, I mean, you're, you're, you're spent. You can't do anything else. I mean, they just hurt too much. They're physically, physically too painful. So usually you see fatigue. The first sign is usually quivering muscles. You start to shake, all right? Um, one of the things that may cause that is low oxygen because as you've overused a muscle, you've made it basically cause it to swell, cut off the blood supply, cut off the oxygen supply, so you've reduced its ability to make ATP using oxygen. 
very rarely, there's only a couple of genetic cases um, where it's a change in acetylcholine. And, and I put that in there because a lot of times on these case studies, it'll, somebody will, um, will tell me, or on, on one of my, I, I used to have an uh, essay question on exam. I don't have it this time. I'd say, you know, give me some reasons for fatigue. And a lot of times people would say, your body doesn't have enough acetylcholine. You got plenty of acetylcholine, okay? It's constantly being recycled. You got plenty. So you never really run out of acetylcholine. That would never cause you to have uh, muscle fatigue. There's just a couple of genetic cases where people can't process it. All right, so what is a muscle cramp? Okay, so fatigue is when it starts to quiver, you know, and you just physically can't move it anymore. You're just exhausted. A cramp is when it's all seized up, okay? Typically, the reason for a cramp is you've used up your ATP, okay? And in order to remove calcium from the cytosol and go back in the sar sarcoplasmic reticulum, you've got to use the calcium pump. Pump means pump means you've got to use force, you've got to use energy, it uses ATP. So you can't get rid of the calcium. The calcium stays attached to the troponin and you stay in a contracted state. So usually you are deficient in calcium. If that's a reason, I mean, uh, deficient in ATP is a reason for the um, muscle cramp. So once you stop, allow your body to rebuild the ATP, then the ATP goes into the, the muscle cells, that pump starts to work again, starts to pump out the calcium, and then your cramp should go away. That's why sometimes people will start to uh, massage a cramp, trying to get the blood flow going, get more oxygen in there. So what's happening? You're getting more blood flow, getting more oxygen in there, you're Start to make ATP again. Then once that ATP gets in there, starts to move that calcium out and your cramp will release. Okay, so when you've expended your oxygen, you've, you've basically worked too hard, gotten rid of all your oxygen, you're in oxygen deficit. All right, so you've had uh, prolonged, vigorous exercise, your muscles are fatigued, they may be cramping. What are you going to do in order to remedy that? You just got to stop. You got to breathe. You got to replenish that oxygen. You got to get that oxygen back in there. Remember, I told you we, in our muscle cells we have all these mitochondria and we have lots of myoglobin. Well, when you're in oxygen deficit, basically your myoglobin's empty. <laughs> okay, it's not holding any more oxygen. You've used it all, so it takes a while to breathe in, bring that oxygen into your blood. Okay, onto the hemoglobin, okay, and then it's going to be carried to the muscle cells, and that oxygen is going to be offloaded from the hemoglobin into the muscle cells and then stored into the myoglobin, and that takes a while. I mean, after a marathon or after running, it may take you several hours to get your oxygen uh, back to where it needs to be in order to restore that oxygen depth, put the oxygen back into the myoglobin so that the myoglobin is fully loaded and ready to go again and make ATP. Okay, so this is, this is something that we can do as athletes. We can uh, basically make our muscle cells uh, store more myoglobin. The more you work out, the more effort you put on a muscle, usually it um, hypertrophies, it gets bigger, but it also uh, builds more mitochondria. It also uh, builds more glycosomes to store sugar. It also uh, makes more myoglobin to store more oxygen. So the more you work out, the more efficient you become because you have all the ingredients to make ATMP readily available for you in your cell. So that's what working out does for you. It basically makes your body more efficient by giving you more oxygen storage capability and more sugar st storage capability and then more mitochondria to make the ATP from that. And it takes a while. It can take months to uh, build up your body to do this. Now, one thing not to forget about muscle activity. All this work that you're doing, what are you doing with the extra energy? You're making heat. So 40% of the energy that your muscle uh, uses is, for, is actually work. But 60% is heat. That's why it gets so hot when you work out. You're generating heat, okay? What do we do to uh, stop ourselves from overheating? We sweat. All right, so we radiate, we radiate that heat and bring our temperature down. So we're really not very efficient. I mean, um, you know, uh, you really wouldn't want that to be, you know, what we're trying to do with our car engines, is, and they're not that efficient either. What we're trying, we would rather have, uh, you know, 80% efficiency for work and 20% is heat. But unfortunately, for, I mean, luckily for us, we're warm-blooded animals, so we need that heat, okay? So we're, we're wanting that heat to be given off. But if you're thinking about making an efficient engine, 
You would rather have more work, less heat, right? <laughs> That's what you're looking for when you're doing a mechanical, uh, mechanical engine. All right, this is a little bit of review from Monday. When you want to make a muscle contract more forcefully, you can either recruit more muscle fibers or motor units, or you can increase the size of the fibers. Just think about it. Bigger fiber is a stronger fiber. So what you do when you work out, you actually hypertrophy the actual muscle cells. The more you work out, those actual muscle cells become larger. They become bigger. And so as they become bigger, they become stronger. So that's kind of one of the things that we look for when we're working out. We're actually trying to hypertrophy the muscle. What word do you use when a muscle wastes away? Atrophy. atrophy. Okay, so that would be the opposite. So if you haven't used a muscle in a while, it atrophies or goes away. If you work out a muscle, make it big and bulky, that's hypertrophy. So that's two ways. You can either recruit more motor units or you can just make the muscle bigger. This is what we do when we exercise. All right, what else can we do? How else can we make a muscle force more contract, more forcefully? We talked about this the other day. We can stimulate it more. We can send more stimulus to it, okay? So you're sending more signals from the brain, increase the frequency, okay, and make the contraction stronger. Do you remember when we did the... We did that. We didn't let the muscle relax. We kept zapping it before the muscle relaxed. We, sent, we increased the frequency, made the force for the contraction stronger. You can do that. Also, you want to look at the length relationship. We have those sarcomeres. If your sarcomeres are too close together, there's nowhere for them to go, right? If they're too far apart, nothing happens. You want them to be just kind of like the mama bear, baby bear, and uh, uh, daddy bear. You want it to be just right. So if you need that uh, muscles to be just in their optimum position, so then you get the maximum force of contraction. Which is why when you exercise, if you're tight, if you're too tense, if your muscles are all, you know, uh, contracted and tight, you want to stretch, okay? But you don't want to overstretch. So when, before you do exercises, you want to stretch those muscles. If they're tight, get them to their optimum uh, length, and then you're ready to go. You just don't want to go too far the other way and stretch them out. All right, so this is just a schematic uh, to show you that when we try to increase our... Um, contractile ability, increase our force, we do more than one thing. So as an athlete, what you're trying to do is you're trying to get a nice balance of all four of these, okay? You're trying to get a little bit of all four to get your, your best contractile force, all right? You want to send enough information, enough stimuli to recruit the large number of motor units. You want to increase the number of motor units. you have activated. If you want to be really strong, not only do you want to activate a lot of motor units, you want those individual fibers to be bigger. So you exercise. Make those muscle fibers larger so that when you do recruit them, you get a bigger contraction. All right? You can increase the stimulus, increase the, the, increase the load, increase whatever, um, in this case, would be the load. For example, if when you're working out, if you're just working out with five pound weights all the time, your body gets uh, uh, basically acclimated to that, okay? But when you go to lift a 10-pound weight, your brain is sending what? More signals, okay, to lift that up. So all you're doing at this point is high frequency. You're sending more signals to pick that up. But after a while, if you've been picking up 10-pound weights for a while, um, what has happened? Your body has started to develop larger muscle, fi muscle fibers, right? So when you recruit those motor units, you're getting a higher contraction. So now what do you got to do to get your muscle stronger? Lift more weights, okay? So you've acclimated again. So now you lift 15 pounds, right? Increase the amount of the fre uh, frequency of stimulation, cause the muscles to hypertrophy, get bigger, and recruit more motor units. So you just keep building this as you try to get stronger and stronger and more efficient. Again, you also want to make sure that you stretch so that your muscles are optimal and ready to go. So we use all of these as we try to. A lot of people just think it's all about bulk. It's just all about getting bigger and bigger and bigger. 
and that's not necessarily the case. All right, when we talk about muscle fibers, they're not all the same. There's actually different types of muscle fibers or muscle cells, okay? We have what are called fast and slow twitch. Most skeletal muscle has a combination. They're, no they're not all slow or all fast. You have a combination of slow and fast inside a muscle, okay? A motor unit is either or. It's either slow or fast, but the muscle itself has a combination of both slow and fast. And look at this word here, oxidative and glycolytic. These two are, oxidative reminds you of what? Oxygen. Oxygen. So these are aerobic. Glycolytic is anaerobic. So you've got a combination of both aerobic and anaerobic muscles, fibers in your body, okay, in each muscle, so that when you want to sprint, you have that anaerobic capability to get started and run that first 15, 20 seconds, and then, who is that? Come on, sound down. Um, then you have those aerobic muscle fibers that are ready to take over once you've depleted those anaerobic fibers. So then you can keep going. So what you're trying to do as an athlete, if you want to be an endurance runner, you want to have more oxidative fibers than you have glycolytic fibers. If you're a sprinter, you want more glycolytic fibers than you have oxidative fibers. And this is something you can do through training. All right. This is in your book. Is I like. I'm not going to go through it. I'm, I've got another slide to, to show you. But Table 9-2 is where all this information can be found in your textbook. I've broken it down a little bit more, but that's where I got this from. Then I broke it down. Um, but for some people, they like to have the side-by-side -side comparison. But I'm I'm going to do it one at a time. Now, when we talk about muscle fibers, uh, they actually have a color. We have basically red and white. Um, think about eating a chicken, okay? Have you ever heard of white meat and dark meat? Okay, dark meat is the red fibers, okay? White meat is the white fibers, okay? So we actually, so you can tell about it. Think about a chicken, all right? What is, if you have a, a, a chicken in a, in a chicken house, do they ever fly? No. Do they walk around a lot? Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's two different types of muscles. One's just kind of hanging out, not doing much at all, and one's really, really working. Which one's really, really working? Their legs, okay? So that's that dark meat. That's that red fibers. These are slow twitch fibers. They have, they're red because they have a good blood supply. They have a lot of myoglobin. Myoglobin holds onto that oxygen and gives them that red color. They have a lot of mitochondria, lots of energy. They're oxidative. They require oxygen. They use aerobic respiration to make ATP. They're good for endurance. So think about a, a, a bird in a chicken house. They're walking all the time. They're always moving, 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 okay? So they're for endurance. These muscles don't fatigue. A chicken can run all day, okay? They don't fatigue. They don't get tired. And you'll see these in, uh, in uh, also postural muscles. Think about the, your postural muscles that you use all day long. I mean, all day long, I'm, especially when I'm teaching, I mean, I'll stand four, five, six hours a day. And these muscles are, I mean, my legs may be not moving much, okay, but my postural muscles are working all day and they don't fatigue. Now, you have some called fast twitch. There's two types of fast twitch. There's oxidative pink. Okay, let me go ahead one, one more slide to show you. There's also uh, fast twitch white. Okay, so let's just think about it. We have red fibers, we have white fibers, we have pink fibers. Hmm. That color tells us something. The pink also has a good blood supply. Not as much uh, myoglobin as those slow twitch fibers, but they do have myoglobin, and that gives you that pink color. It doesn't have as many mitochondria as the slow twitch, but they do have a fair amount. They're aerobic, and again, they don't fatigue. And these are muscles that we use a lot of for like sprinting and walking, not endurance, but uh, for things that we do every day, you know, typing, uh, exercises that are pretty repetitive, but not necessarily for endurance. They last maybe five minutes to 10 minutes to 20 minutes, not hours, okay? Now fast twitch white fibers, they're white because they have less blood supply, 
They have less myoglobin. They don't have as much mitochondria. They use anaerobic respiration, and they fatigue really quickly. These are those short burst movements, things you do really quickly and are over. For example, you know, like swinging a bat and hitting the ball really, really quickly. That's a fat, those are fast twitch fibers. So they fatigue very quickly. So this is my turkey versus a goose. So let's think about how these animals work. Okay, these are two very, they're both birds, okay, but they're very different. For you hunters out there, you'll, you'll be able to follow this a little bit better, but I think I can get you guys on the right track. Let's think about a turkey, okay? Uh, this is a wild turkey. What do, do wild turkeys fly or run most of the time? They run. They're runners. What about a goose? They fly. All right. Now, if you've ever eaten a wild turkey or looked at turkey, many of you see at Thanksgiving, and you guys can figure this out. Think about on a turkey at Thanksgiving. The turkey breast is what? White. The legs, the drumsticks, are dark or red. Okay? Think about a goose. If you've ever eaten goose, have you ever seen what goose meat looks like, especially wild goose? The breasts? Have you ever eaten a, about, I mean, any dove hunters in here? What does dove meat look like? It's red. It looks like liver. Duck meat's the same thing. So, Goose and duck. The breast meat is dark. The leg meat is not not white, but it's it's lighter. So it's for all intents and purposes, it's white. They don't use their legs a whole lot. Um, so if you think about it, so the turkey is running all the time. It's got that dark meat. Okay, those slow fibers that don't fatigue because they're walking and running all the time. They can run from run, 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 run. When they need to get away really quickly, they will fly. They can fly, but a very short distance. Okay, they'll fly up to a tree. Okay, or maybe fly 15, 20, you know, yards away. Then they're done. They come back down to the ground. So white fibers. Okay, they're, it's white meat. Fatigues really easily. It's not good for endurance. Their endurance muscles are dark. You look at a goose. Same thing. They fly for days and days and days and days and days and days. Right. So they need high endurance muscle in their in their chest, okay, to flap those wings. You're going to see that dark meat. They may run a little bit, they may paddle a little bit, but they don't use their legs a whole, whole lot, so it's that lighter color. So when you're trying to think about what these slow oxidative and fast glycolytic and fast anaerobic, think about an animal. Think about something you can relate to and say, okay, this, this one uses its wings very rarely, white meat, okay, this one uses its wings a lot, dark meat. Okay, maybe can help you uh, keep the two straight. Um, what about the pink? Like if the bird is anaerobic and white anaerobic. It's aerobic. It's kind of a half. It's kind of a halfway. And I'm. I'll. Uh, hang on just a second. And I'm going to talk more about that. Now, the limiting factor on how strong a muscle can be is how much oxygen in food are available, okay? If you don't have oxygen and you don't have sugar, then you can't make ATP. So that's, that's, the, that's the availability of ATP is a limiting factor. All right, you've got to have that. You've also got to have muscle tone. Those muscles have to be in shape and optimally stretched to be ready to go. And this is a problem with uh, people who have paralysis. The problem, if you've got, have had a stroke or something that's basically cut off uh, information to an area, uh, especially like if you've had a stroke and you have paralysis in an arm, what's happening is those, remember I told you your, your spinal cord is constantly sending signals to your muscles to kind of make them twitch just a little bit to keep them ready to go. And so if you've had a stroke or any kind of nerve damage to a muscle, that it's, the muscle's still there. It's still physically able to contract, but it's not having that constant stimulus to the muscle to keep it toned, then it won't contract well. It's, it's, out, of, it's out of shape. All right, so does training matter? All right, when we, when we think about, you know, trying to uh, get ourselves ready for a race or some big event, does it actually help to train? So why do we do aerobics? When we do aerobics, endurance exercises, when we do things that are aerobic, make us breathe heavy, and uh, you know what aerobics are, you know, swimming, running, things like that, it actually causes our muscles to build more capillaries. You know what capillaries are? 
teeny tiny blood vessels. All right, so here's your heart, okay? So the vessels coming away from the heart are the arteries, okay? Then you've got the capillaries. This is where the actual exchange of oxygen carbon dioxide inside of an organ occurs. Then that uh, vessel becomes a vein and goes back to the heart. So you actually will build more capillaries. If you have more capillaries inside of a muscle, you have more areas for exchange, more ways for oxygen to get into the muscle. You actually increase the number of mitochondria. And you actually cause all those nuclei inside the uh, muscle to make more proteins, and one of the proteins that they make is myoglobin, and myoglobin can hold more oxygen. So the more aerobic exercise you do, the more blood supply you get, the more mitochondria you, you get, the more myoglobin you get, and the greater your endurance. You can also, Lee, you can convert those fast glycolytic fibers into fast oxidative. So you can convert those white fibers into pink fibers. Okay? You can't convert fast into slow, but you can convert fast glycolytic into fast oxidative. So that's what you're trying to do. When you're trying to increase your endurance, you're basically trying to change your body. You're trying to give yourself more of these fast oxidative, which is more resistant to fatigue, gives you better endurance. All right. Uh, why do we do resistance training? Could we do aerobic training to basically increase our blood supply, increase our myoglobin, increase our efficiency? Why do we do resistance training? That's a whole different ball game. Why do we increase our load? That's in order to make our muscles bigger. The only reason you do resistance training is to make bigger muscles. So as an athlete, what you want to do is both endurance, aerobic training, and resistance training. You don't want to just have big, inefficient muscles, okay? You can have huge muscles that aren't very efficient, okay? You want to have big muscles that are also efficient. So a lot of people are, are just runners. They never weight train. Are they just weight trainers and they never run? You really want to have a balance of both, okay, so that you can, off, you can do things for a prolonged period of time and do them well and do them uh, with strength. When you do resistance training, when you increase the load, load do more weight, uh, you increase your mitochondria, but you also increase the myofilaments, okay? What are the myofilaments? That's where the actin and the myosin are, okay? So there's actually bigger muscle cells that are more contractile. When we overload a muscle, when we overload or pick up too much weight, that basically forces the muscle to work harder, okay? And your muscles will adapt to that. So that's, that's why you usually start with a light load, work your way up to a heavier load, then a heavier and a heavier and a heavier. But you've got to do that over time. Um, when you overload a muscle, the muscle actually rips and tears and is basically destroyed. Okay, that's why you're so sore after a really, really big workout. When you've gone out and you haven't worked out in days and days and days, and you go get a 20-pound barbell, and the next day you can't move. You've actually damaged the muscle. But because we got so many nuclei in the muscle, and your brain's like, well, is she going to do this again or not? <laughs> it's not really sure. I better be prepared because she's so stupid. She might go do this again. So your nuclei are, <laughs> are going to make more proteins and build that muscle up so that the next time you do that, it's ready to go. So that's so you're, you're not quite sure. Your body's like, I don't know. She may go out and try this again. Let me be prepared. So it's going to basically increase the muscle size so that you're able to do it again the next time. That's why every time you do it, you're a little bit better. So if you work out for two weeks, finally you're not sore anymore. So what do you do? You go get some more weight, and your body goes, oh, she did it again. Now i got to build more muscle. i got to be prepared for the next time she's stupid enough to go do this. All right, so you work out for two more weeks, and you're not sore anymore. What do you do? You go do a bigger workout. So your, muscle, your body's basically responding to that, that overload to produce more muscle, more fibers, to give you bigger muscles to make you stronger. All right. Now, when we talk about muscles, somebody asked me this in lab the other day. It may have been my other class. Uh, they were asking, we're talking about, um, if you've been in my Monday lab, you know, we talked about the quadriceps. Some of the muscles in your quadriceps bring your knees in, some bring your knees out. And she was asking me, how come, uh, you know, kids, they kind of walk with their, they kind of walk bow-legged, their knees kind of go out or they go in, they don't walk straight. It's because those muscles are developing as they get older. When you start to walk, if I'm standing here like this, you can knock me over, right? How, how am I more stable? 
like this, okay? That's what kids do. They kind of walk like this. When they first start to walk, they look like Frankenstein. They kind of walk like that because they're trying to stay balanced. But that's not an evenness of their muscles, okay? They're using other muscles more than they are. Uh, they're using kind of their outside muscles or adducting, abducting their legs more than they're abducting, adducting their legs. So they tend to build these. So they tend to get a little bit um, bow-legged, all right? Because as they're growing and they're balancing, their muscles and their nerves are trying to coordinate. And so what you'll find is the coordination of muscles occurs head to toe. All right, so your, your nerves and your muscles start to work together and learn to coordinate and work as a unit head to toe. Does that make sense? Think about it. What's the first thing a baby does? Raises its head, then it crawls, then it stands. So your musculature and your ner nervous system have to kind of learn each other and work their way down from head to toe, all right? You get your peak control around adolescence, okay? Now, you can improve that with training, and we all know that. The more you do something, like think about typing. The first time you go up to a computer, you're like, eh, 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 eh. but the more you do it, the faster you are, right? So you can actually improve your neural control of your muscles with training. Of course, it's going to go downhill after adolescence. You know, once you get my age, it starts to fall apart. All right? <laughs> now, in females, uh, our muscle mass is about 36% of our body weight. Okay? We're mostly water. We really are. Uh, males, about 42% of their body weight is uh, muscles, and that's due to testosterone. Testosterone tends to hypertrophy muscles, tend to make them uh, a larger muscle mass. Um, but interestingly, the strength per muscle, the actual unit strength, if you took this much muscle from a male and this much from a female, we're the same strength, okay? They're not any stronger. Males aren't stronger than us. They're only stronger than us because they have what? More. They have more muscle. But pound per pound, we're the, we're the, it's, the same, it's the same strength. Fiber's a fiber, okay? They just have more of it than we do. All right. Um, as you get older... You start to get more connective tissue, okay? Think about those muscles, and you have uh, the epimesium and the paramecium, and you have fat associated with muscles, okay? As you get older, you tend to have more fat, less muscle. So by the age of 30, you basically lose about 30% of your muscle mass, and that's called sarcopenia, all right? Can you stop that? Yeah. What do you do? You exercise. That's why once you reach 30, you've got to continue to exercise to keep your muscle mass, all right? And that's when you're keeping that muscle mass, you're keeping that force of contraction on your bones, and what are you also preventing when you're putting more force on your bones? Osteoporosis. So these things go hand in hand. These muscles and bones go hand in hand. At about 30, that's one of the reasons we get osteoporosis. We're losing our muscle mass. We're not putting any pressure on those bones anymore, and they start to deteriorate. So we've got to keep those two in balance. The last thing I'm going to cover just briefly, uh, when we get to the, the nervous system, and i got to do my, yeah, i got time, uh, we're going to talk about multiple uh, sclerosis, and a lot of times you'll hear MS and MD. You have no idea what that means, okay? You're like, oh, there's, there's Jerry Lewis. He's doing the, that M something. You, have, you don't know which one is the M something, all right? Well, there's two things, muscular dystrophy and uh, muscular, multiple sclerosis, and they're kind of similar in that they're in their, in their overall effect. Basically, they're both tend to be fatal, and they both tend to be very debilitating. But one is a disease of the muscle, and one is a disease of the nervous system, okay? But they tend to have a very similar end effect. Um, muscular dystrophy is actually an inherited, uh, and we'll talk about multiple sclerosis later, but muscul muscular dystrophy is inherited. And it basically destroys the muscle. And it's kind of interesting, because when somebody's first diagnosed with muscular dystrophy, uh, you kind of go, well, they don't look like they're wasting away, and they don't. Their muscles actually enlarge, but they enlarge due to more fat and connective tissue, not muscle fiber. So that dystrophy is kind of like uh, dys means abnormal, abnormal growth. So they're not growing normally. They look big and nice and healthy, but they're not made of the right composition of fat versus muscle. All right, so what's happening is they look like they have really large, healthy muscles, but they have a lot of fat in those muscles, and those muscle fibers are atrophying, so they become weak. Okay, and a lot of times it winds up with paralysis. The muscles, the breathing muscles don't work anymore. They have trouble breathing, so it's, it's not a good thing uh, to have. Typically fatal in your 20s. 
Um, the most common one is called Duchenne's. It's very severe. Um, it's sex linked. It's carried by the females. So you get it from your mama, unfortunately. Um, it usually shows up somewhere uh, mid-teens. And the victims start becoming clumsy. They start to fall because their muscles, they look healthy. They got nice big muscles, but they're not effective anymore. They don't have enough muscle fibers. And like I said, they usually, their respiratory muscles start to fail. And usually around their 20s, it tends to be fatal. Um, there's not a cure yet. There are treatments, but no cure. Uh, there's some hopeful research with stem cells. Uh, but you guys know all the controversy around stem cells, so we'll just have to see where that takes us. Uh, my, my personal opinion is I'm for stem cell research, um, but uh, that's not necessarily the case of most people. So, but there is some hope, so we'll have to see if we can get uh, stem cell research back on track. It uh, doesn't necessarily mean you're taking cells from aborted babies. We've, we've, kind of convert, we've kind of said stem cells and abortion are the same thing. It's not. Uh, you can get stem cells from cord blood. Uh, you can get stem cells from your bone marrow. So there are ways to do stem cell research without actually getting into the whole abortion issue. So hopefully we'll, we'll get to where we can actually have a better treatment of muscular dystrophy because it is a very sad disease. Um, all right, let me see. 